Welcome dear students. Today we are going to discuss India-Pakistan relations, a checkered history of conflict, cooperation and violence. And we will also look at the bilateral issues that have arisen between the two countries since their independence and the measures and mechanisms adopted to resolve these issues. In this lecture, we are going to cover the following key themes. Bilateral issues between India and Pakistan, moments of cooperation, negotiations on Kashmir, composite dialogue process. In his 2010 book, India, Pakistan, Coming to Terms, Ashutosh Misra says that it took almost 50 years for India and Pakistan to establish the composite dialogue process in May 1997 in Maldives. So 1997 marks an important shift in India-Pakistan relations. Misra says, not until 1997 had it become amply clear to both sides that they were neither so strong that they could impose any unilateral solution on the other, nor so weak as to accede to the other's will without a fight. In a way, we are looking at India-Pakistan relations from two different geopolitical eras, the Cold War era and the post-Cold War era. I'm highlighting this point here because the Cold War, like elsewhere in the world, influence the Kashmir issue. But we will come to that in a while. In this lecture, while we discuss India-Pakistan relations, we will be focusing particularly on the negotiations and peace processes on the Kashmir issue, which, as you will see, has been the core and most contentious issue between the two countries. Let me first give you a brief overview of India-Pakistan relations with respect to the bilateral issues that were negotiated and resolved till 1997. During the last 75 years as post-colonial nation states, India and Pakistan has had a checkered and sometimes violent career. Deep distrust, acrimony, recurrent military hostilities have characterized the relationship. India and Pakistan have fought three wars on Kashmir, 1948, 1965, and 1999 and engaged in endless skirmishes across the line of control that divides the erstwhile princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, which is the site of a protracted armed conflict since late 1980s and remains the core bilateral issue between the two states. While conflicted relationship has been dominant for the better part of their history, there have been also rare moments of cooperation between India and Pakistan. One of such rare moments was the Inter-Dominion Treaty signed by Prime Ministers Liaquat Ali Khan of Pakistan and Jawaharlal Nehru of India in December 1947. Under this treaty, both countries resolved to trace, recover and return to their respective communities the women abducted and forcibly married during the partition-related violence. For those students interested in reading more about this issue of abducted women, I would recommend Urvashi Butalia's award-winning book, The Other Side of Silence, published by Penguin Books in 1998. Another instance of bilateral cooperation came a decade later. After six years of negotiations, India and Pakistan agreed to the World Bank proposal to divide the Indus water systems that flowed into each other's territories. The idea of a joint development and management of the water systems was first suggested by David Lalienthal, a former head of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission and the Tennessee Valley Authority. The latter is considered as model for natural resource planning. Under the Indus Water Treaty signed in September 1960, Pakistan got exclusive rights over the western rivers, that is Indus, Jahalim and Chinab, while as India got exclusive rights over the eastern rivers, which is Ravi, Bias and Satluj. The treaty also provided for a permanent Indus Commission, which has been instrumental in settling the disputes peacefully. It is pertinent to mention here that the Indus Water Treaty has withstood two wars, 1965 and 1999, and numerous instances of diplomatic crisis between the two countries. The two countries also managed to reach a negotiated agreement over the issue of the run of Kutch, a marshy, uninhabitable area situated between the Gujarat state of India and the Sindh province of Pakistan. 
the issue of Iran of Kutch had given rise to serious military skirmishes between India and Pakistan in the spring of 1965 because the area was disputed. British Prime Minister Harold Wilson's intervention helped calm the tempers and the two sides agreed to refer the dispute to an international tribunal. The princely state of Kutch had acceded to India in 1948 while a Sindh had become part of Pakistan. These two areas shared a border along a terrain which India described as marshy and Pakistan described as landlocked sea. From Indian perspective, the 1947 partition did not affect the boundary between the Kutch state and Sindh and India had claim over the entire run which was within the territory of Kutch. Pakistan claimed the northern half of the run based on the historical evidence that the Sindh administration had exercised jurisdiction over the area after Sindh was annexed and made part of the British India Empire in 1846. So, Pakistan contended that there was a disputed boundary between Kutch and Sindh which needed to be determined and demarcated, while India in response argued that the boundary was well defined and only a portion of it needed demarcation. On 19th February 1968, the Indo-Pakistan Western Boundary Case Tribunal peacefully settled the case by awarding 90% of the disputed area to India and 10% to Pakistan. Both countries agreed to the decision. While India and Pakistan successfully managed the issue of the abducted women, the Indus water systems and the run of Kutch, they could not find a solution to the Kashmir issue that was acceptable to both. So Kashmir has eluded a permanent agreement or resolution despite the United Nations Security Council and major powers mediating the dispute. Even a formal peace process that was pursued for nearly 10 years at the turn of the last century could not achieve any major breakthrough. But before we turn to the post-1997 peace process between India and Pakistan, let us first look at the negotiations on Kashmir in the initial years after 1947. International mediation efforts on the Kashmir issue. The princely state of Jammu and Kashmir became disputed after Pakistan rejected the instrument of accession signed between the last ruler of the state, Maharaja Hari Singh and Union of India. And the two countries engaged in a war inside the Jammu and Kashmir territory. In January 1948, government of India under the leadership of Jawaharlal Nehru, referred the case of Kashmir to the United Nations Security Council pursuant to Article 35 of the United Nations Charter, which says, and I quote, any member of the United Nations may bring any dispute or any situation of the nature referred to in Article 34 to the attention of the Security Council or of the General Assembly, unquote. India had become member of the United Nations in 1945 and Pakistan in September 1947. For India, the case was about Pakistan supported aggression against Indian sovereignty over Kashmir and Indian claim over Kashmir was the instrument of accession. India requested the Security Council to call upon Pakistan not to allow its territory for operations against Kashmir and prevent its nationals to fight inside Kashmir. Within a fortnight, Pakistan lodged a counterclaim in which it contested the validity of the instrument of accession, alleging conspiracy between Hari Singh and India. Calling instrument of accession illegitimate, Pakistan emphasized that Kashmir's legal status should be decided through a plebiscite to ascertain the free and unfettered will of the people of the Jammu and Kashmir state as to whether the state shall accede to Pakistan or India. In this letter, dated 15th January 1948, Pakistan also made references to Junagadh and the states of Kathiawar, which the complaint read, have acceded to Pakistan. Pursuant to Article 34 of the UN Charter, which pertains to Pacific Settlement of Disputes, the UNSC passed Resolutions 38 and 39. In fact, the UNSC mediation in the early years of the conflict led to a raft of resolutions. But, these resolutions were non-binding, so they made the parties involved only morally bound, not juridically. Effectively, it meant that the final resolution of the dispute depended on the goodwill of India and Pakistan. 
when the five member United Nations Commission for India and Pakistan arrived in the subcontinent, both countries welcomed it. Under the UNSC Resolution 47 of 1948, the Commission was mandated to facilitate the plebiscite process in Jammu and Kashmir. But the two sides could not agree on how many troops of either country can stay in Jammu and Kashmir during the poll. The UNSC appointed mediators proposed alternative solutions, which were rejected on one pretext or another. Writing in his 2005 article, Would a Plebiscite Have Resolved the Kashmir Dispute, which was published in Journal of South Asian Studies, Christopher Snedden argues that Pakistan could not accept a situation of potential Indian administrative or military control and therefore dominance throughout Jammu and Kashmir, and the Indian government would not compromise in any meaningful way on this issue. So, despite its best efforts, the United Nations was unable to broker a compromise. While the UNCIP could not achieve the political breakthrough on Kashmir, it managed to negotiate a ceasefire between the two countries that came into effect on 1st January 1949. Since then, India and Pakistan remain respectively in control of roughly two-thirds and one-third area of the erstwhile princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. U.S. President Truman and later Eisenhower tried to intervene outside of the United Nations. Both pressed upon the South Asian neighbors to find a solution to the problem. But what complicated the matter was Pakistan joining Seattle in 1954 and Sento in 1955. Pakistan's move to formally embrace the Western alliance alienated USSR, who had been taking a neutral position in the United Nations on the Kashmir question. In November 1955, Nikita Khrushchev and Nikolai Balganin visited India and declared Kashmir as an integral part of India. Subsequently, Soviet Union consistently blocked resolutions on the Kashmir issue. Pakistan further alienated the Soviet Union when President Ayub Khan signed a 10-year lease with the U.S., allowing the strategic base at Peshawar to be used to operate USA's U-2 mission, a surveillance over Soviet territory to locate its nuclear and missile sites. Moscow was incensed by this move, and accordingly, a warning was issued to Pakistan on May 9, 1960, when Khrushchev bluntly told Pakistan ambassador in Moscow, Salman Ali, and I quote, Peshawar has been marked on our map. In the future, if any American plane is allowed to use Peshawar as base operations against the Soviet Union, we will retaliate immediately and have to aim our rockets at your bases as well, unquote. Deep Washington engagement. In November 1962, in the wake of the India-China war, U.S. President John F. Kennedy sent Assistant Secretary of State William Harriman along with Paul Nitz to the subcontinent on a high-level mission to get a better understanding of the situation uh, which was the 1962 Sino-India war and to deal with the Kashmir issue. Harriman's mandate was to find a solution to Kashmir conflict. He held several talks with the leaders of India and Pakistan and Nehru and Ayub Khan agreed to renew the bilateral negotiations on Kashmir. From the Kennedy administration perspective, the India-China war had created a new situation and the US intended to provide military aid to India to counter the communist threat. However, mindful of its ally Pakistan's interests and concerns, the US officials were of the view that the long-term military aid to India should be conditional to progress on negotiations on Kashmir. In his book, The Kashmir Conflict from Empire to the Cold War, Rakesh Ankit argues that for Washington, the Sino-India dispute was a great strategic opportunity to enlist Indian support in Asian matters. The Harriman Nitz mission discussed a subcontinental federation with a common defense pact backed by the US, common administration in the Kashmir Valley with both India and Pakistan having access, and the creation of a common market. American professor and diplomat Howard Bruner Schaffer says in his book, The Limits of Influence, America's Role in Kashmir, that American intervention during this time was, I quote, 
by far the most intensive and extensive the United States government has ever undertaken to help resolve the Kashmir issue, unquote. According to Alistair Lamb, in 1963, India and Pakistan engaged in direct negotiations on Kashmir, and solutions other than the plebiscite were seriously considered by Pakistan. And India too, reportedly, was willing to cede parts of Kashmir to straighten out the border. But, like previously, these negotiations also failed. The 1965 India-Pakistan 17-day war over Jammu and Kashmir was inconclusive. Under the Tashkent Agreement, signed on January 10, 1966, between Indian Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri and Pakistani President Ayub Khan, the status quo ante was restored, that is, captured territories were returned. However, in the wake of this war, representatives of important world powers visited South Asia to make conciliatory efforts and to get the Kashmir issue resolved. In December 1968, British Foreign Minister visited New Delhi and offered mediation on the Kashmir issue, but New Delhi rejected the offer. In January 1969, Shah of Iran tried to mediate on Kashmir, but he too failed. In May 1969, Russian Prime Minister Kozygin visited Pakistan and presented a new formula of softening the border to Pakistani leaders, but they did not accept it. In July 1969, American President Nixon visited New Delhi with a proposal, but Indian leaders rejected it too. So as you can see, the negotiations and mediation efforts during the 1950s, then in 1960s to resolve the Kashmir issue consistently failed. Although the cause of the 1970 war between India and Pakistan was not Kashmir per se, the war, however, resulted in the Shimla Agreement of July 1972 which had a bearing on the Kashmir dispute. Under this agreement, India and Pakistan agreed to resolve their issues, I quote, by peaceful means through bilateral negotiations or by any other peaceful means mutually agreed upon between them, unquote. Furthermore, they agreed to convert the ceasefire line in Jammu and Kashmir to line of control, a de facto border. The clause four Subsection 2 of the agreement said, and I quote, In Jammu and Kashmir, the line of control resulting from the ceasefire of December 17, 1971 shall be respected by both sides without prejudice to the recognized position of either side. Neither side shall seek to alter it unilaterally, irrespective of mutual differences and legal interpretations. Both sides further undertake to refrain from the threat or the use of force in violation of this line." Unquote. Although the Shimla agreement would act as a template for future diplomatic engagements, it was violated by both countries. First by India in 1984 by seizing the Siachen Glacier under Operation Meghdoot, and in 1999 by Pakistan by seizing strategic heights in Kargil area which resulted in a limited war between the two countries. The Kashmir insurgency that broke out in late 1980s put further strain on the bilateral relationship and the two countries remained engaged in a prolonged diplomatic crisis. India accused Pakistan of sponsoring a proxy war in Kashmir through the use of non-state actors, while Pakistan used international forums to denounce human rights violation in Indian Kashmir. But despite the Kashmir crisis, the prime ministers of the two countries had meetings at SARC summits and on the sidelines of UN General Assembly sessions in New York. Foreign secretaries of India and Pakistan met several times and held rounds of talks leading to preparations of useful agreements on confidence building measures. Major breakthrough happened in May 1997 during the ninth SARC summit in Maldives, where Prime Ministers I.K. Gujral of India and Nawaz Sharif of Pakistan had a 90-minute meeting in which they agreed to set up working groups to handle contentious issues such as Kashmir and establish a hotline between the two prime ministers in addition to the military one that already existed. Including Kashmir in the agenda was a compromise from India and raised hopes of rapprochement between the major South Asian neighbors. The May 1998 nuclear tests by India and Pakistan 
posed a challenge to the peace process. But the situation was diffused after the signing of the Lahore Declaration in February 1999. In the context of the nuclear tests, the Lahore Declaration reaffirmed the earlier bilateral treaty, India-Pakistan non-attack agreement that was signed by the two sides in December 1988 to control nuclear arms race in South Asia and to prevent accidental attack on nuclear sites. But the scope of Lahore Declaration was wider, as in it, both sides agreed that their respective governments, and I quote, shall intensify their efforts to resolve all issues, including the issue of Jammu and Kashmir, shall intensify their composite and integrated dialogue process for an early and positive outcome of the agreed bilateral agenda, unquote. The 1999 Kargil misadventure of Pakistani General Parviz Musharraf acted as a spoiler in the peace process. The Kargil war occurred in May-July 1999 and caused approximately 3,000 deaths. India managed to regain the lost territory after Pakistan withdrew its troops. The US mediation was crucial for de-escalation. But the Kargil war complicated the matters. It is said that the war coverage by news channels stoked national sentiments in India. Two years after Kargil, India and Pakistan leaders met at Agra in mid-July 2001 for summit-level talks. The event started with high hopes, but no breakthrough was achieved and the summit collapsed. According to author A.G. Nurani, the Agra summit was sabotaged at the 11th hour. He apportions major blame on Indian Deputy Prime Minister L.K. Adwani. Writing in Frontline magazine in August 2005 issue, Nurani says, and I quote, Adwani wrecked a fine diplomatic achievement for India for his own petty gains, unquote. After the 13 December 2001 attack on Indian parliament, New Delhi initiated a full-scale military mobilization. Fearing a major war between nuclear armed states and disruption to its war against Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan after 9-11, Washington intervened and exerted diplomatic pressure to ask New Delhi and Islamabad to scale down. In January 2002, Pakistan president announced policy reforms condemning radical Islamists for running a state within a state. He banned six extremist groups including LET and JEM, which was held responsible for parliament attack. According to analyst Rifat Hussain, by hinting at moving away from the United Nations resolutions on Kashmir and assuring action against anti-India non-state actors operating from Pakistani territory, Musharraf, I quote, helped create much needed political space for New Delhi to substantively engage itself with Islamabad for finding a workable solution to the festering Kashmir dispute." Unquote. On May 2, 2003, India's Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee told the Indian Parliament that he was willing to make his third and final effort at peace by agreeing to hold decisive talks with Pakistan to resolve the India-Pakistan dispute. Between 2004 and 2007, during the Manmohan Singh government, India and Pakistan continued talks under the framework of composite dialogue process. There was a discernible impact of the peace process on the Kashmir situation. Kashmir witnessed considerable reduction in violence and death. From nearly 3,000 fatalities per year in 2003, it came down to approximately 500 deaths by 2008. It is said that both countries had almost reached an agreement on Kashmir through back-channel diplomacy. According to WikiLeaks cable, dated April 21st, 2009, the agreement was on a non-territorial solution. Among several confidence-building measures, the two countries agreed to a ceasefire in 2003 along the line of control in Jammu and Kashmir and opened up the LOC for cross-Kashmir bus service and trade. Conclusion since its initiation, the India-Pakistan peace process has been derailed by unexpected events, both violent and non-violent. After the November 2008 Mumbai attacks, India suspended talks with Pakistan 
blaming Pakistan based armed groups for the attack. India also called off scheduled bilateral talks between foreign ministers in September 2018 in protest against Pakistan issuing a postal stamp on Kashmiri militant Burhan Wani. A deadly suicide attack on an Indian paramilitary convoy in Kashmir flared up tensions between the two countries in February 2019. And relations further nosedived after the New Delhi read down Article 370 and revoked special status of Jammu and Kashmir. Pakistan responded by downgrading its diplomatic relationship and suspending bilateral trade with India. Consequently, the peace process has stalled and no meaningful steps have been taken for the resumption of bilateral relationships. Though in February 2021, the two militaries issued a joint statement wherein both sides agreed for strict observance of cease firing along the line of control and all other sectors. This move, however, is seen in the context of the border skirmishes between Chinese and Indian forces along the line of actual control in Ladakh. By signing a ceasefire agreement with Pakistan, India has tried to keep the Western Front peaceful while dealing with the actively hostile Northern Front. All this goes on to show that India and Pakistan relations are hostage to the Kashmir issue. And unless both countries reach some understanding on the issue, peace will remain fragile between them. This in turn keeps SARC from achieving its full potential as a regional grouping as the two major countries of South Asia remain locked in enduring rivalry, undermining economic integration of the region. Dear students, with this, we are signing off our today's lecture. Hope you have enjoyed it. Thanks for watching it.